again, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for our chapter book story time here at the Caribou Public Library. We're continuing to read Little Butches, Father and I Were Ranchers by Ralph Moody about his family and their experiences when he was growing up in Colorado. All right, so today, chapter 12 is titled, I Go After Two Dog. The next morning, I was up as soon as the first light peeped over Loretta Heights. Mrs. Corrin had told me to come back to herd her cows right after haying, but I had a different idea in my head. Bill was still just barely alive, and I was going to get Two Dog to come and save him. Before anybody else was up, I went out and sat beside our barn where we had sat the night he and Mr. Thompson stayed at our place. From there, I could get the best look at the mountains when the sun first struck them, and before it got high enough to light the land between them and me. Mother had a stereoscope that you could put pictures into and make them and move them to make far off places come right up close. The early sun did the same thing to the mountains. I could shut my eyes and see just how two dogs' fingers had shown me the way to his camp, then open them and trace the trail up through Turkey Creek Canyon. So it seemed almost as though I'd actually been over it. I got up and swiped a quart of oats for Fanny so she could have them all cleaned up before pa father came out to give the horses their regular breakfasts. By half past six, I started off up the road on Fanny as if I were going to the Cochorans, but I had three cold biscuits hidden in the front of my blouse. All spring, father had talked about our driving up to the mountains some Sunday, but for one reason or another, we never did it. They looked as though they had started just a little way beyond the hill in Fred Altland's back pasture. Turkey Creek Canyon was quite a way south, and the most direct wagon road ran along the west end of our place, past the schoolhouse and Carl Henry's. But I knew father would never let me go alone, and I didn't want anybody to see me, so I headed west, past Altland's wheat field, then cut southwest across country, straight for the V that marked the mouth of the canyon. I knew better than to run Fanny up hills, so I was so anxious, oh, but I was so anxious to get to two dogs, and the distance seemed so short that I lay tight down against her neck and we went up over Fred's big hill like a jackrabbit in front of a coyote. Looking from the top of that hill, I could see a series of others rising one beyond the other toward the hogbacks that stood before the Rio Mountains. Until then, there hadn't been any doubt in my mind that I could get to Two Dogs Camp without a mite of trouble. But with all those hills between me and the mountains, I began to get a little bit afraid and wondered if I shouldn't go back and talk to father about it first. What do you think? Hmm. Oh, as soon as we were out of sight over the top of the hill, I stopped Fanny and let her catch her wind. The more I thought about talking to father, the more I was sure that he wouldn't let me go. And I was just as sure that Two Dog was the only one in the world who could save Bill. So I kicked my heels against Fanny's ribs. At first, there were crops in the valleys between the hills and a few ranch houses. So I had to ride miles out of my way to get around them. Every time we got to the top of one hill, there was just another beyond it. And the mountains didn't seem any nearer than they had from home. I knew Fanny was beginning to get tired because the hills were getting steeper and she was climbing slower. There were no more crop fields in the valleys and I started riding around the hills instead of over them so as to save Fanny the hard climbs. Two or three times we came to deep gulches that we couldn't get across and had to turn back and find another way. If it hadn't been for the mountains, I'm sure I would have been lost, but I knew their shapes well enough so that I could always tell where I was. I was getting close, or it was getting close to noon, and the sun was bearing down like a hot stove lid when we came into a green little valley with a spring of cool water in it. We both drank all we could hold, and while Fanny grazed and I ate my biscuits, oh, while Fanny grazed, I ate my biscuits. <laughs> I must have squeezed them a bit because they were pretty well crumbled up and some of the pieces were soggy with sweat, but I was hungry and they tasted all right. The sun was hanging low above the mountains when we came over the last hill and I could see the break in the hogback where Turkey Creek had cut its gorge. As we came closer, I could see that there was a little used wagon road along the north bank of the creek. I loped Fanny toward it and we followed it through the gorge and into the mouth of the canyon. The misgivings I had when we were on top of Fred Altland's hill were nothing to what I had when we came into the canyon. The creek ran through a narrow cut and the walls seemed to rise straight up for a mile. From there, the sun had set a cool breeze, sun had set and a cool breeze was drawing down between the, cl the cliffs. 
All I had on was my blue shirt and overalls, and after the heat among the hills, it made me shiver. I don't know whether I shivered more because I was cold or because I was frightened. I had never seen mountains that were more than big rolling hills, and it seemed to me that those black rock walls might fall on me any minute. Then I really began to be afraid that I could never find Two Dogs Camp. I stopped Fanny and shut my eyes tight, trying to bring back the way he had pointed out the trail with his fingers. But all I could see was a big green blotch with black rock walls running up to around it. As I had sat beside the barn with Two Dog a couple of weeks ago, and again that same morning, I had been able to picture the trail just as I was sure it was going to look, but it was all different now. For a minute or two, I was going to turn back, but I knew that night would come long before I could make it, and I could never hope to find my way home in the dark. I kicked my heels into Fanny's ribs and we went on. The harder I tried to think how Two Dog's fingers had moved, the more confused I got. In half an hour, it had become darker and colder in the canyon. I could remember that Two Dog's fingers had shown the trail going in quite a way before it branched off, but he had made them go straight while the trail wound in and out against the wall of the canyon. At last I thought that if I could just be sitting down behind our barn again for a few minutes, I could remember it all right. But of course I couldn't do that. So I slid off Fanny and sat down with my back against the canyon wall. I was so tired I almost went to sleep and it must have been when I was just between being asleep and awake that it all came back to me. I could remember that he had shown the trail going up as though there was a steep hill and then angling off to the right. I climbed back on Fanny and put her into a good stiff lope. It wasn't more than 10 minutes before we came around a shoulder of rock and the track climbed steeply up a shelf on the canyon wall. Just above the rise, the trail forked. The main track followed the shelf above the creek, but a thin thread of it turned up the side of a jagged cleft through the rocks to the right. I had no question in mind and turned Fanny up the steep side trail. The sun had sunk so low that it no longer shone on the top of the peaks above me. And I began to get panicky for fear black darkness would catch me and we would fall to the bottom of the gorge if Fanny made a misstep. I dug my knees into her withers and kept her climbing so hard that it made her breathe whistle through her nose. It made her breath whistle through her nose. We were nearly at the top of the climb when the whole air of the canyon was ripped to pieces by a sound that almost made my heart stop. It was a howl that seemed to come from nowhere in particular, but from everywhere at once. As it echoed back and forth between the canyon walls, sh uh, cold shivers raced up and down my back and it felt as though it were covered with stiff hair that was standing up as it does on a frightened dog. Fanny must have felt just the same way I did because her ears pinned back tight against her head and I could feel a tremble pass through her withers. She crowded close against the cliff and stood shaking. I started thinking about father and mother and the rest of the youngsters at home. I wanted to turn Fanny and race out of the canyon as fast as she could go. But when I looked down into the gorge, it was as black as well. Though I'd never heard a wolf's howl before, I had read about it and I knew that was what I must have heard. I tried to remember the sound and see if I could figure out whether it came from above or below, but I was so scared I couldn't think straight. And when I shut my eyes, I could see gray shadows racing up the trail behind me. That settled it. I kicked my heels into Fanny's ribs and tried to cluck to her, but my mouth was so dry that I only made a hissing sound. I think that was the first time Fanny ever trusted my judgment more than her own. She gathered her muscles and tore up the rest of the grade as though the wolf had had her by the tail. We came out onto a flat rock ledge, raced across it, and were out onto a narrow path that wound through great boulders. Fanny was taking the sharp turns of the path so fast that I had to hang on with every ounce of strength in my knees. We must have gone a mile or more that way. I could hear every breath she took rasp through her throat like tearing cloth. It was deep twilight when we came out into a little open field set in between tall black looking trees and the path was gone. I saw it on the reins and pulled Fanny to a stop in the middle of the field. We stood shivering as though it were below zero. There wasn't a sound except the rushing of Fanny's breath. The first thought that came into my head was timber wolves. I had read stories about their tearing wood choppers to pieces and, turned fa and I turned Fanny to get back out of there the way that we had come in. But I couldn't even see a gap in the wall of black trees 
I was so panicky, I couldn't remember whether there should be more to the trail or not. Without even thinking what I was doing, I yelled, Two dog! At the top of my lungs, the sound came yodely like a coyote call. A second later, an oblong of light from an open doorway showed at the edge of the woods. And Mr. Thompson's voice called out, Hey there, little papoose. Mother used to sing a song about the golden gates of heaven, and that's what the yellow light coming out of the doorway reminded me of. I leaned forward a little bit on, on Fanny, and she went over there on the fly. I guess that light looked as good to her as it did to me. When I rode up to the door, Mr. Thompson told me to light, to light down and come in while he put Fanny in the corral. At first, I didn't want to let him take her and asked if the wolves might not get her. But he just laughed and said, Ain't saw a wolf round these parts in years, seven two dogs, old tame one. Always hollers when there's anybody on the trail and generally scares them off. That's how we know you was coming. Their house only had one small room and not a single window. It was made of poles on the front and sides and built right against a ledge so that the back wall was solid stone. The spaces between the poles were stuffed with hard-baked adobe and straw. There wasn't any stove or chimney, but there was a cleft in the ledge about three feet deep that they used for a fireplace. It was wedge-shaped and about as wide as it was deep at the bottom, but the top narrowed to less than a foot. The floor was partly a flat rock and the rest hard dirt. There were two bunks at one end of the room, one above the other, but there weren't any bedclothes or mattresses. The springs were made of tightly stretched horse hide and the covers were mountain goat skins with long white hair. The only furniture was a table and two stools. The table must have weighed a ton. It was nearly four feet wide and had been made by splitting the butt of a log in two. The legs were heavy stakes driven into holes in the ground side of the log. One stool sat on each side of the table. They were made the same way and didn't look as though they'd ever been moved. Pieces of wagon iron, worn horseshoes, and a harness hung on wooden pegs on the walls. Strips of dried meat and bunches of herbs were tied to a line in front of the fireplace. The only lamp was a bottle of fat with a rope wick in it. It didn't have any chimney. Two Dog was sitting on the floor beside the fireplace with his back against the stone wall. He didn't get up when I came in, but his eyes lighted and he held one arm toward me with the palm of his hand down. I didn't know how to shake hands with his palm turned down like that, so I just took hold of the ends of his fingers, then let go and sat down beside him. He didn't say a word, but reached over and laid his hand on my leg three times, the way he did beside our barn. It was five or ten minutes before Mr. Thompson came back from putting Fanny in the corral. I had plenty of time to show Two Dog how Bill was lying on our barn floor with his back all humped up and how he was pounding his head and, and how he was breathing. I used to wonder if the reason Two Dog didn't talk was because Mr. Thompson talked enough for both of them. As soon as he came back from putting Fanny in the corral, Two Dog said about six words to him, kind of grunts, I guess it was Indian. Then Mr. Thompson began asking me questions faster than I could answer them. He wanted to know if father and mother knew that I was coming up there and how I had found the place and if my folks wouldn't be worried about me. All the time he was talking, he kept fussing with something in the big black iron pot over the fire. While I was telling him, he took three dented old pie tins from the table and started ladling out stew. It looked like rabbit stew, but the gravy was thick and brown. There was a covered iron kettle sitting on the floor by the fireplace. Mr. Thompson fished a few cold biscuits and three iron spoons out of it put a biscuit and a spoon on each plate and gave one to two dog and one to me. He sat down on a stool with his plate beside him on the table. Mr. Thompson kept asking questions all the time between mouthfuls and telling me to hurry and to eat my victuals so he could take me right home. I was real hungry and the stew was good. So I just let him talk until I had cleaned up my plate. Just as I was sopping up the last of the gravy with my biscuit, two dog patted me on the leg again nodded his head toward his plate and said, skunk, good. For a minute, I thought I was going to be sick, but I decided it wouldn't hurt me if, I didn't, if it didn't hurt them. And it stayed down all right. <laughs> so he was eating skunk stew, huh? As soon as Mr. Thompson was through eating, he snatched up the stew pot and took it outdoors. I heard him clapping his hands before he came back. Two dog got up, took a coil of thin shiny rope from a peg in the wall, and motioned for me to follow him out the door. As I did, my heart jumped into my throat and nearly stopped. 
a big gray wolf was eating from the iron pot. He was standing in the light that spilled through the doorway. And when he lifted his head, his eyes glowed like live coals. He snarled and the hair bristled on his shoulders, but two dog grunted at him and he faded away into the shadows of the trees. The moon had risen and two dog led the way along the woods at the edge of the field to a pole corral at its far end. There was a break in the trees so that moonlight flooded the corral and I could see nearly a dozen meaning, mean looking horses inside it. Fanny and the two buckskins that I had seen at our place were among them. They started milling when they saw us and crowded into the far end of the corral, snorting and rearing against the poles. Two dog motioned to me to stay outside while he crawled through the bars. He seemed so frail and old that I was sure that they would kill him, but he walked straight toward them. As he went, he, took, he shook out a loop in the horsehair rope, holding it in one hand and letting it trail along behind him. He was almost to them when one of the horses whistled and they all came racing toward him. I ducked my head without meaning to, and when I lifted it, Two Dog was snubbing one of the buckskins to a corral post. The buckskin jumped and reared, fighting the rope for a couple of minutes, but it didn't seem to worry Two Dog a bit. He waited for the bronc to calm down and then led him to the gate and haltered him. I watched like a hawk when he caught the other buckskin, but I couldn't see how he did it. He didn't any more than snap his wrist and forearm, but the rope leapt off the ground, passed over another horse's back and came loping, looping down around the buckskin's neck. It all happened in less than a second. After that, he caught Fanny the same way, only didn't have to snub her to a post. As soon as she felt the rope around her neck, she stopped dead still. Two dogs snapped his wrist again and the loop that looked like a little barrel hoop ran up the rope and settled around her nose. Then he led her to the gate and put her bridle on. I started to climb up the poles to get on her, but Two Dogs shook his head at me. There was a rawhide strap about an inch wide hanging on one of the corral poles. He cut a piece of it a little more than a foot long, sliced about half of its length into three narrow strips and braided them into Fanny's mane, way back close to her withers. Then he showed me how to grab it with one hand and swing myself up so I could get an arm over her back. From there, it was easy to pull myself on and Fanny wore the raw-hided braid in her mane as long as she lived. Two Dog led the horses to the house and when Mr. Thompson came out with the harness, he was all dressed up in his calfskin vest, 10 gallon hat and high heel boots. When he harnessed the horses, Two Dog went in and put on his black coat and derby. When he came back, he was holding a small leather pouch that rattled as if it had dry leaves in it. I don't remember much about the trip home that night. One minute I was listening to the drumbeat of the buckskins running hooves, and what seemed to be the next, Mr. Thompson was passing me over the wagon wheel into Mother's arms, and she was crying. I was awfully sleepy, and I just remember having my head against her neck and telling her I was sorry, and she was carrying me through the bunkhouse door. It was pretty late when Father came and woke me. He sat on the edge of my bed and held me on his lap. Then he told me how wrong a thing I had done and that it had frightened mother so that he wouldn't be surprised if it took several years off her life. He said that every man in the neighborhood had been out riding the hills looking for me and that he thought mother would have lost her mind if he hadn't made her believe that Fanny would have come home alone if anything had happened to me. Then he said that really wasn't so because she might have broken a leg in a gopher hole and fallen on me. I don't remember father ever kissing me any other time, but after he put me back in bed, he leaned over and kissed me right on the forehead. I didn't wake up until late the next morning. When I did, Mr. Thompson and Two Dog were gone and Bill was up on his feet, nibbling at a few wisps of alfalfa. So whatever he did <laughs> helped their horse, didn't it, Bill? Well, that's all for chapter 12 today. That was kind of a long, long one, but I hope you guys enjoyed it and we'll see you here next time. Have a great rest of your day.